does this and does this. Welcome everybody to the uh, Wanderlust School of Transgressive Placemaking. Thank you so much for joining us today for the last of our June series. Today is, uh, what is today? Today's Tuesday and uh, Documentation and Legacy is the title of this talk. We're really excited to have you all join us to help us reimagine and remake the far side of the no trespassing sign. Um, so, uh, I'm Ida, and this is Nathan. We are Wanderlust. Thanks for being here. Um, joining us today um, is uh, Steve Dunko, who, uh, uh, aside from being pyrotechnic in residence at NASA, but he's not doing that, he is assistant professor um, of uh, Media Culture Society. I don't know, I've been told to make this up, so I'm doing my best. Um, at NYU. Um, he's written numerous books on the history of um, activ uh, uh, activism and media in the United States. Um, and he is also a co-founder of the Center for Creative Activism. Um, Annie Correa uh, is co-founder of Cowbird, um, which is an online um, visual storytelling platform you should all check out. Um, and she is also a journalist and reporter at large. Um, so we'll be hearing from them about um, how do you create um, documentation um, and uh, journalistic coverage for, for events um, and cultural happenings um, and political movements? How do you cater to a secondary audience um, and what can you expect from that secondary audience? We're uh, going to be taping everything today, so uh, we'll have a video that we'll stick online when we're done. So if you can't remember anything that was said, you know, we have a professional note taker taking some notes. Um, and first, let's uh, have a word from Dylan Thurse. Ladies and gentlemen, Alice Obscura's Dylan Thurse. Uh, thanks for coming out, everybody. Uh, for some of you, this is maybe your first time. Some of you have seen that two, three, four of these. So thank all of you so much for, for coming to the series. Uh, I run, in case you don't know, I run a website called Alice Obscura. Uh, it's a compendium of the world's wonders, curiosities, uh, and one of the things we do is we put on events here in San Francisco and LA about discovery, exploration, what that means today. Uh, and Wanderlust is uh, currently in residency at Alice Obscura, so we've been incredibly honored uh, to work with them on these series of talks. Um, as I said, this is our fourth about documentation. We've already covered risk assessment, uh, um, design was oh, the legality of, of doing any of this type of thing. Um, so this is the fourth one, and in a way I think, uh, you know, I spent a lot of time uh, working on the web, working about how you present places when you're not in them. Uh, so this is a particularly interesting one for me about documentation. Uh, so without further ado, uh, thanks for coming, uh, everyone, and I will hand it back to you, Nathan. documentation and legacy and something about a little old lady in Japan and I was I have no idea what this all means but I'm gonna refract it through my understanding through activism um, it's a wonderful introduction about the NASA stuff it's all a lie but the true part is actually um, I have been an activist for about 30 years and with the artist Steve Lambert I run the Center for Artistic Activism and one of the things we're very interested in and is how activism has always been a creative practice, although it's not often looked like in that way. Um, as one of my friends, David Solnit, once said, who's a great activist, um, he said, all politics is theater, but most of it's just really bad theater. Um, I'm interested in good theater, and I'm interested in this idea of activism as an artistic practice, particularly when it comes to documentation and legacy, because in those are the things that activists have to be concerned with, is how we are documented, because that is often how we are portrayed to a larger world outside of just the people that happen to be on the scene. And also how that documentation leads to what is a legacy. And we could talk about this uh, in terms of current events, things like Occupy Wall Street and Arab Spring, or go way, way back where we usually start our history with biblical times. Um, you think about it, what is Exodus in the Hebrew Bible or the Gospels? 
of the New Testament or the Quran other than basically a documentation and legacy of three pretty kick-ass activists. Um, but my focus here is actually going to be on the civil rights movement um, and three ways to think about documentation and legacy and how it played out here. This is just sort of a thought experiment. I'm not going to really detail much. Um, this is often how we remember uh, the civil rights movement and how it was documented. This is part of it, um, that is the idea of a mass movement led by a charismatic leader. But what I want to show you is something a little bit, uh, what should we say, um, what I think was more important than actually this image which has been left with us, which is how the civil rights movement actually consciously used images and documentation in what I think are very novel and creative ways. So we're going to start with this. Um, we all know this woman. It's Rosa Parks. Um, and it's an epic moment in the civil rights struggle. Rosa Parks, who is a Montgomery, Alabama seamstress, who's tired after a long day of work, and in 1955 refuses to give up her seat to a white man and sit in the back of a segregated bus. And it's an act which really launched the civil rights movement. Um, probably, you all know that story, right? Okay. Um, what some of you, some of you probably know this story too. Um, but the fact is, is that uh, Rosa Parks wasn't just some seamstress who was tired. Um, she was uh, an experienced activist and political organizer. Her grandfather was a Garveyite. Um, she started organizing uh, around the Scottsboro Boys in the 1930s. Hosted voter league meetings in the 1940s, and was the secretary of the local chapter of the NAACP in the 1950s. She trained at the Highlander Institute, which was a culture and politics institute in Tennessee at that time. In other words, she was an actor who was very conscious of exactly what she was doing, okay? That is, she sat, went on that bus and refused to give up her seat, knowing full well what the ramifications would be and also the support that the civil rights organizations would give her. None of this means that it wasn't real, okay? But what it does mean is that it was also a staged act. And this iconic photograph, which we all know, um, in your mind, you probably think it happened that day. And then you're conscious, you think about that, and you say, that's ridiculous. It couldn't have happened that day. And of course, it didn't happen that day. It was staged three days later. Um, and this fellow here, I've always thought this was just some white guy, you know, uh, uh, and it was just some white guy, but he wasn't some <laughs> southern white guy. He was an AP news reporter um, who was asked to sit behind her to give some sort of racial contrast to this one. Um, it's also interesting that, that it actually uh, Rosa Parks was not the first to do this and not the first to be arrested. There was a woman named Claudette Colvin, um, but she was 15 years old. She soon became pregnant and she was unwed, and the NAACP wanted a more respectable face and a more seasoned activist to be their actor, um, if you will, for the civil rights movement. Um, we often think of performance as creating a fantasy. It can be this, but I think it's also useful to think about it as allowing us to visualize and act out our dreams. That is, I'm sorry, we often think of performance as creating a fantasy. Um, and that's actually a useful way to think of it, but it's also that performance is useful in actually dramatizing reality, okay? Uh, that is, is, I like to say, reality needs a little help as well. Uh, nowhere was the civil rights movement performance of reality better demonstrated than the SCLC, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference campaign, to desegregate Birmingham, Alabama in 1963. Uh, and so many of our images of Southern racism and the civil rights movement come from that demonstration. This image of a man being attacked by police dogs, school children being marched off to jail, or um, the Birmingham Fire Department turning their hoses on peaceful protesters. Um, we all know that th these pictures. What probably less of us know is the entire thing was staged. In fact, it wasn't staged once, it was staged twice. Um, the SCLC pulled off the same campaign in Augusta, Georgia a year earlier, and it failed. It failed miserably because the police just rounded up people very civilly, very politely, stuck them in jail for four days, and then let, let them out after all the reporters had left. No story, no images, no nothing. It didn't happen. So Martin Luther King and his lieutenants learned from this, and they picked Birmingham, Alabama for all sorts of reasons. 
There's just been a, a host of uh, string of church bombings there. Um, Birmingham had a long history of both union and um, civil rights organizing. But most of all, they picked it for this guy right here. This is Bull Connor, okay? Bull Connor was the police chief of Birmingham, Alabama. He was also an out-and-out -out racist. He had been a former Ku Klux Klan member, um, and he was belligerent in his policing. And what they needed to do is they needed to provoke Bull Connor into revealing the brutality of Southern racism, which if you were an Afri African American, you experienced every single day when the news cameras were gone, when the sun went down, but you needed to bring that to light. And sure enough, what they did is they cast Bull Connor in his role as villain, and he played it out perfectly. He unleashed the dogs, he unleashed the fire department, and what happened was a series of photographs is spread around the world, and the Civil Rights Act was passed one year later. I like to call this making the invisible visible. By dramatizing the aspects of reality that are hard to see, because they're hidden from public sight, too abstract to conceptualize, because people just don't want to look at them, we can make the invisible visible. Again, say these events were staged with an astute eye for aesthetics does not mean that they were lies. They were real. What the activists in the civil rights movement were doing is not fabricating fantasies, but what they were doing was dramatizing reality and making a reality invisible to most of the rest of the world quite visible. One more example. Uh, this is the famous lunch counter sit-ins in 1960 in Greensboro, North Carolina, in which a group of black college students from a local college um, sat down at the local Woolworths and demanded to be uh, uh, fed, demanded to be waited upon. Um, of course, in the South at that time, this was against custom and it was against law. Woolworths was a segregated, had segregated lunch counters in the South. It was an action very similar to Rosa Parks uh, insofar as it was a demonstration of dramatizing reality. But I want to use it to illustrate another thing, which its documentation did and its legacy it left. That is, we often think of, use the word demonstration and protest interchangeably. But they're actually, they have different connotations. Um, and I think demonstration is a far more interesting connotation insofar is that their act of civil disobedience as Rosa Parks, these students, and so on, were not just a protest against, but a demonstration for something. That is, the way the world ought to be, in which African Americans should be able to sit down at a segregated light lunch counter. And so by doing that, what they do is act as if, and this would be the sort of third quality of this documentation, is one of the things that documentation can capture is the world not as it is, but as it ought to be. And so what you do is you perform the world not as it is, but the way that you would like to bring it in. You act as if it's already there. And in doing this, we can bring our future into our present and normalize as reality that only exists in our imaginations. Through this documentation, it gets a certain level of reality. It has a certain veracity. And then, eventually, hopefully, it passes into our legacy. And that's it for me. Thank you.
I, uh, I started reporting like a lot of people used to, uh, covering uh, crime, covering breaking news. Um, I was responding to uh, calls of any criminally suspicious death um, from the time I was in my mid-20s. So anytime there's a criminally suspicious death in New York City, the police have to inform the news media. And the editors then inform reporters and then or decide if they're going to send out stringers or legs. So I was, um, it's a very antiquated term, but I was the legs of the New York Times um, being sent out to see what had happened um, whenever there was a criminal and suspicious death. So the reason I bring this up is because usually there is some precipitating event that allows us to see that parallel to our everyday lives, and our routines are these totally unseen worlds. Um, they might be communities, networks, economies that we otherwise wouldn't know at all if there wasn't some usually violent moment in which normal life clashes with this other world. So um, those are the moments that you need to focus on because they're usually the moments in which you can break into something and really stand to reveal this whole other world to a broader audience. So for me, just to name a few of those moments, um, there was a trucker found um, bound and gagged in his semi under the Pulaski Bridge. And so my editor said, you speak Spanish, I want you to go out and find out what happened. So I showed up under the Pulaski Bridge, of course there's police tape, but there was nothing else. And we had to find out what, why did this guy, why was he and what world did he belong to? Well, after a day of reporting, we discovered that he was one of a community of Costa Rican truckers that trucks the city's trash every day from um, a trash processing center in Queens to um, New Jersey and Pennsylvania. And he had been um, killed because he was keeping all his cash in the truck with him. He slept in the, in the truck and he kept his cash there. Um, in another instance, I you know, there was a, a man shot in a, an underground poker um, center, and by following, literally following drops of blood through the building, we sort of discovered that there had been this, um, you know, kind of like little underground poker center that had been there for a few months. And slowly, by just hanging out, all these other people came expecting to play poker only to find that you know, the police had cased the place out. But we discovered that this particular poker ring just switched locations every three to five months. And the police knew that we knew anything about it. So any one of those stories could open up onto a documentary or a larger project. But the key is to be there when that first event happens and to get a guide. So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, getting a guide and what to do once you do. Um, but I'm going to start with my most recent story, which is out of Oklahoma. Um, I went to Oklahoma about two weeks ago, uh, not knowing anyone, not having a single source, not having any way into the story. All I knew is that a major tornado, actually two major tornadoes had hit, and, um, and there was bound to be story there. So I actually have a sort of fixation on people who go from storm to storm. So I showed up not knowing what I would find. And I met um, Saul Saltzman. And he became my guide to um, disaster chasers, to this economy of people who go from disaster to disaster. So I'm going to play a little bit from the piece that I made about Saul, and then talk about a few of the practicalities of what you do once you find your story and you find your guide. Saul's been doing cleanup work for more than a decade. Hurricanes, earthquakes, forest fires, ice storms. He was in Joplin and spent three years in New Orleans after Katrina. His crew calls him the wolf, like Harvey Keitel's character in Pulp Fiction, because he's the guy who comes in to clean things up. But he's not what you'd expect. Saul's in his 30s, but he's boyish, kind of short with shaggy hair like a skater. He's covered in scars, and he walks with a limp, because he used to be a stuntman in Hollywood. 
He crashed motorcycles, jumped from buildings. He doubled for Al Bundy's son, Bud, on Married with Children, too. He had to quit stunt work after one too many injuries. These days, Saul mainly focuses on large commercial jobs. But if he needs the work, he'll tear down houses, too. The key to getting these residential demo gigs is to be as non-threatening as possible, to appear local. So the first thing he does after a storm is get a new phone. Yeah, I buy a, I get a phone at Walmart. Uh, so you have a local phone number because people are more receptive to that. Did you do that on your way here, though? No? Yeah, I did it before we left. I already had the 405. 405 is the local area code. Hey, this is uh, this is Sal. I met you at Chili's. Yes. Yeah. Uh, about uh, doing some sales with the demolition stuff. Yes. Yes. On a day I spent with Sal, who sometimes calls himself Sal. He was trying to recruit a local Chili's waitress to go door to door, pitching his services to homeowners. Okay, I'll call you back. Okay, see ya. Bye. She knows a ton of people. Yeah, I go door to door because then she would like, you know, could talk like, oh my, because her house got messed up. And, you know, it's better. Saul says the most important factor in getting work: get there first. He runs a pretty big operation: fifteen trucks, semis, and dump trucks. <sighs> a bunch of excavators, bobcats, dumpsters, and a couple of buses which he uses to haul workers. For a big storm, he says his convoy can be as long as two football fields. And when he's chasing a storm, racing his convoy across the interstate to, say, Louisiana or North Dakota, he doesn't want to bother with those way stations along the highway where all the trucks are required to check in. That would take hours. So how does he get away with not stopping? Saul plasters his truck with FEMA signs. I got it from someone who had one for real. And I made tons of copies. I think you saw one today in my truck, and I put that all over the windows. What are they playing? Well, it says emergency vehicle, and has like the FEMA thing, so do not delay. So then I came up with, uh, you know, you can buy old police cars really cheap. So I bought a police car and an ambulance, and, and then I turned the ambulance, so I gutted it out, you know, made it just a box truck to hold tools and everything, and then I put those in the convoy with everything else. No one ever bothers us. I asked Saul if this was legal, and he said pretty much. He said pretty much. He said the normal rules are usually lifted in a disaster. On okay, so as you can see, Saul is playing lots of stunts, and he is, um, you know, part of this world that you never think of when you hear about a natural disaster. You don't think about the fact that there are people swooping in from around the country to demolish houses, remove debris, um, provide dumpsters, provide porta potties. It's this huge economy and it's also a community and there's you know hierarchies, there's you know vicious competition. Everyone calls everybody else vultures. Um, as if they were somehow the exception to the rule. But um, so Saul became my guide to that world that we never know about. And um, it was great because he gave me access to basically every part of that world um, by just letting me hang out with him and see what he was doing. And he also could break down you know, how it works. He's been his demolition guy and has been chasing storms for over a decade. Um, so he could sort of say, oh, this is how it works. There are contracts, there are subcontracts, there's labor, this is where it's corrupt, this is how it you know, functions. So if you're uh, a journalist or you're thinking of becoming a journalist, this is the kind of character that you need and the kind of event you need because no one cares about demolition guys. People care about tornadoes. So you both need a guide and you need drama in, with, that, with that single event that draws people, draws people's attention to that community. So how do you get a guy? Um, it's, it's not simple always, but the first rule is just to show up. Show up, hang out, and keep in touch. Because oftentimes the guide for one story is going to be the guide for another bigger story some, at some point down the road. So um, cultivate your sources. Um, keep in touch with them, become their friend on Facebook, ask them now and then, you know, what are you up to now, or do you know of anybody else who's doing something? So those are kind of the rules for getting a guide. Um, 
the rules for keeping a guide are sort of basic and common sense, but um, keep them safe. So, uh, you know, have a very frank conversation with your guides to these worlds, um, very close to the beginning of your relationship, in which you outline what your role is, and that, you know, you're their friend, but you're also a reporter or a documentarian, and that anything that they tell you, you may use as part of your story, unless they make it explicitly clear that you should not use something that they've said. So just sit down and have a really clear conversation with them um, about the, at the beginning, and ask them what the, they do is legal and illegal, like I asked Saul. You know, we want, we really wanted to use that piece of tape in this radio piece, but what he's doing could get him in big trouble. I mean, it amounts to impersonating a federal officer. So you need to have those conversations without losing your best material in which you make your sources aware of the consequences they can face by going public. And they also need to make you aware because you as a journalist could be breaking laws that you're not aware of. And especially if you're not credentialed as press, there's not so much that can be done to protect you. You could also get arrested. And there, you know, if you have an NYPD press pass, it'll get you out of some trouble. But as we saw with Occupy Wall Street, it, it's, it's, it's no sort of, it will not inoculate you. Um, so have that conversation about legality. And then the final thing, I guess, would be to really prepare um, in terms of what it means to go into these sort of shady worlds not that we have not far from here. Um, make a contingency plan, um, figure out a map, uh, bring a phone. You might not be able to charge your phone, so figure out what to do if you are separated from your source or your guide, and bring extra batteries. So that would be my um, my advice. And uh, I think the last thing I'd say, sort of working off the last talk, is that um, documentation isn't just images. Sometimes we can't get images of these places. So work with the obstacles, not against them. Audio is a fantastic way to capture a place when you don't want to you know, expose anyone to unnecessary harm. Let them speak, let them use aliases. Is that the word? The plural for aliases. Um, let them use or, or not use the name at all and have them describe what they're saying. I mean, Saul got so sick of me because I'd be like, Saul, describe what you're seeing right now as if I were a blind person. And I said that like a hundred times. I called him the other day and he was like, so describe to me what you're seeing, you know, as if you were a blind person and I was walking through here. But that's what you need to do if you're there, like following someone around with a knife in their face. They need to make that, the invisible, visible for the person listening to the radio. So that can be actually a very liberating uh, factor in transparent reporting. So that's it. Okay, so we're going to, I think I've got at least a question to start off with, and uh, we might have a couple questions, and then we'll open it up here, and we can all pack, it, pack up things. Um, we, uh, as, as Wanderlust, we have this thing where this, we, there, there's kind of two things we care a lot about. 50% of the work we do often falls under the transgressive half, and 50% falls under the placemaking half. And when we're trying to talk about this with people and also have other people talk about what we're, what we're doing or what we're making, um, very often people only see the transgressive half because it's the first thing you often notice. The, the, it's the flashy part. It's the part that's catching on fire. It's the, you know, it, it's the, uh, the sparkling bit. Usually the placemaking is not quite so sparkling right up front. Um, and so we are, really want to know, like, how do you find good documentation that where, where people aren't just, you know, aren't just digging in for the clicks, where people just aren't, you know, tying, just going for the flashy stuff, or just going for the clicks. Um, because, I mean, 
good, you know, it's good to get those, but too often it's only one-sided. Um, yeah, that's, I don't know, I mean, I guess, I guess the question is how do you get people from the tornado to the community that follows the tornado? Like, like how, how, do you, how do you get them to go on that journey with you? This is tornado. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take that. Um, yeah, it, it's sort of, you, you find, I think, whatever drew you to the story. Um, one of my favorite quotes is that Elmore Leonard said, I try to leave out the parts that people skip. And so as a, as a journalist or a documentarian, remember the moment that you were like, wait, what? You did what? And um, try to use that, those, those moments that really make a, a community sort of come to life, sort of make you prick up your ears, um, and use those to draw people into the larger story, into the process, into the backdrop, into the history. Um, but you can't forget that you are also, you know, you're, you're your own best compass in what is interesting. And then you use the other stuff kind of to curve those highlights. Um, yeah, I mean, I think often the stuff that I work with is incredibly unsexy, things like income inequality. Um, and what we do as activists is actually figure out the book that will get a reporter to cover us, um, figure out an image that will become enough of the media can in order to show up on the front page. Um, and then we try to shoehorn in facts and figures. I'll give you an example, which would be um, when I worked with uh, Billionaires for Bush. And essentially, Billionaires for Bush was an offshoot of a very boring group of United for a Fair Economy in Boston, which is very interested in economic justice. Um, and what they understood is that nobody else was interested in economic justice. Um, it's abstract, it's uh, poor people don't tend to buy newspapers as much, and so on, and they're not good advertising paid, okay? And so how do you get them to cover it? So they hired this guy, Andrew Boyd, who had him come up with a campaign, um, which ended up being Billionaires for Bush after a couple of permutations. And what Billionaires for Bush would do would be stage these ridiculous things like the Million Billionaire March and make the case, you know, they go out in front of the post office on April 15th to thank normal Americans for paying more than their fair share <laughs> and things like that. And it was ridiculous, it was ludicrous, and so on and so forth, but it was also a story and a story that journalists needed to cover things which they actually really did care about quite often. And so they would come to the protest and say, okay, so this is what you're here for, but here's the facts behind what we're actually doing. And often what they would do is they'd use the sort of, you know, the spectacle, but also then shoehorn in those facts as well. And then that's what they all we cared about, hoping that people would actually get to those facts. We also did clever things, and this is Andrew Boyd again, who did this, is coming up with a title like Billionaires for Bush, that no matter how it's misquoted, it still says Billionaires for Bush, okay? And so we always have to assume that anything you do is gonna be spun, and often spun against you. Um, and so you've gotta kind of think two or three steps ahead. My favorite example would be Abby Hoffman, um, who was a, a yippie, the 1960s sort of creative activist radical, who realized that every time he was interviewed by the mainstream media, they would denigrate him, they would twist his words, they would quote him out of context. So he got in the habit of just swearing, um, which means that they would blank out his words, which also meant that everybody around the country thought that he was saying something so much cooler than he possibly <laughs> said, okay? And the idea here is understanding how the media game is played and playing it a couple of steps ahead. Not ever expecting that what you want to get out of your message is going to get out, and so understand what journalists are doing, the constraints they're under, um, and it's always making it easier for them to often tell the stories that they would like to tell. Uh, uh, I don't know if this is a question yet, but I'm, I'm captivated by these characters that we've had put in front of us. We have, we have Saul and we have Rosa Parks. Um, and it seems like the unifying thing among them is that they're both seasoned performers, right? To get his job done, Saul has become a phenomenal performer, um, impersonating all sorts of people um, throughout his job. You pointed out the fact that, that Rosa Parks comes from a tradition of activism. Um, and so she understands.
So, so I wonder, like, what's what's so we we need these these conscientious actors to serve as guides, but like like where does it become too much of a performance in that you actually like lose the thing that's worth telling a story about anyway? Well, I think you just have to be conscious of how much the person that you're interviewing is aware of their own persona. Um, but try to get them to break character now and then. Um, you don't have to you know, sort of push them to that point. But um, it makes for a much more interesting layered story if you sort of say this stunt person is actually also you know, under a whole lot of pressure to you know, pay a lot of people. But um, yeah, in the case of Saul, uh, he was a seasoned performer, and he really like worked every angle. He's a baby-faced guy who actually commands huge numbers of people, and you know all sorts of equipment, and has people strewn across the country. But he looks like he's like a skater who's 25. So he would just you know sort of look like he didn't know what he was doing, look really young and use that to his advantage. I think that that's a lesson for us also as documentarians, is that it's really good to work off people's assumptions about you as well, and to be aware of that. When you're in these situations, particularly when you're in Harris situations, I mean, I know that if I weren't um, a young woman in certain situations, I wouldn't have gotten the access that I did. I wouldn't have, because people were like, oh, is this part of your college project? <laughs> sure, I'll help you. <laughs> so, you know, like that's part of our job as well. And I think that's why there's a certain kinship between journalists and, you know, uh, performers or these people who are sort of playing tricks to get the job done because we have to do the same thing. Um, I'm always amazed, like, you know, I watch sports every once in a while. And they always ask someone after the game, so how was the game? Um, and there's this just stock response, you know? Well, you know, we played a good ball game. You know, they, were, they, were, they were a tough team, but you know, we really came together, and so on and so forth. And I, and I think, it, and they have said absolutely nothing, but you expect them to say absolutely nothing. And I, and I do think that when I hear the reporters put a microphone in front of the, the man or woman on the street, you get this sort of stock response. And so one of the things that a lot of the activists I work with um, have been doing is moving away from the authenticity of Rosa Parks, uh, which can always be debunked. And certainly, um, it wasn't you know, it wasn't the time. It's always that danger. And also, I'm not sure people believe it anymore. After reality TV, people don't really believe that anybody's saying anything that is real. And instead, a lot of people I work with actually create cartoon characters. Um, people like Reverend Billy, for example, or the Yes Men. Um, and I think it's an interesting strategy because instead of trying to be the authentic person who is actually performing and therefore can be revealed as inauthentic, is they parade themselves as absolutely inauthentic um, and thereby actually open up a space to say something which is quite real. Okay. We have people here representing both sides of the coin. Um, let's talk. Who's first? They're going to talk. You're going to ask questions. Just to be clear. You can talk. You can ask questions. All right. Questions. Uh, right back here. Uh, I have a, another question about Saul. I'm curious um, if he met resistance uh, in putting on a performance of something that he wasn't. If he rolled it in his ambulance and people expected, you know, actual ambulance equipment and he came out with tools and he was still offering help but he wasn't who he portrayed and he was. Did he need resistance in that way? No, he's never met resistance with the police cars or the ambulance. Um, and in fact, when I interviewed people in Oklahoma about how they felt about being you know, inundated with um, people trying to do demo work and, and volunteers, and you know, people expect it, and he hasn't met resistance. In terms of the reaction to this piece, uh, this piece was on This American Life, it has a lot of listen to it, and as far as I know, he hasn't um, caught any flack for what he went on air saying. So take, take from that what you will. And you can take a lot of risks um, on the air, and um, and no one's inquired or, or contacted me. In fact, the only people who have contacted us are reality TV producers. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, sorry, I know this is 
supposed to be audience questions, but I have one more to piggyback on that. Um, you mentioned about like keeping keeping your sources safe. Um, and I, I can't imagine that the civil rights movement like always only looked for reporters that were interested in keeping them safe, right? Um, so like what like what do you what do you do if you're if you're trying to like partner with so so like I, I guess for for the actors, I, I it's been fascinating talking to you two and realizing
but both the people that you brought are only documenting for sort of what would in parallel be the second lot of these. Um, and so I want to hear from you sort of the challenges and, and the compromises that happen there, and to maybe hear from you guys if you also face those, like if there's a sort of primary, primary audience in that, in that way. Okay, primary audience versus secondary audience. Is that basically it? Sure. And how do you, how do you attack that? Are you looking at me there? He asked a question. I mean, so, so. <laughs> um, you, you, have, you have some good thoughts about this. You start. Uh, so, so a fundamental difference from some of the examples that I've put out is that um, one of those primary activity is um, experience design. So we are often, first and foremost, thinking about the physical audience that, or the, the players, or, you know, whatever we guests. We have all sorts of names. Um, oftentimes we spend so much time designing for them that, that we think way too late about the secondary audience, which is part of the reason why we're having this conversation now, is we need to figure out what whatever whatever story or whatever value there is for that secondary audience is so fundamentally different from the audience that is present. Um, this might actually be mobilizing that primary audience to be the bridge to the secondary audience. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not sure, and I don't think that we've actually done a very good job yet of, of negotiating those two. Um, and we have stacks and stacks of documentation, be it photos, be it primary documents from these locations that we've researched, um, tons of historical data. Um, and it's like, what, what do we do with this now? Like, we've created, we've created this experience, and we've created this body of knowledge, and like, how do we then get it back out there? And oftentimes, the journalistic coverage of the events is really just touching on the tornado, um, which is exciting because we create that content. We, we're creating these like little tornadoes, which are much more pleasant to be in than an actual tornado, luckily, um, that then can precipitate a deeper investigation and like more curiosity about all sorts of issues. But 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 what that is and how to bridge that, I, I'm, I'm consistently dissatisfied with our work there. So. Yeah. Uh, uh, allow me the space to criticize us. The, the title, of the the, the uh, part of the title of this talk was for the little old lady in Japan, which for us means uh, that was that was us imagining someone who is the farthest removed from the world that we're in. Um, and, and 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 what does this look like to this person? I don't know how to reach that person. That's actually why we're here today, and that's why we picked two very different people to talk today. Um, there's something that I care very deeply about just in New York City. I think New York City criminally underutilizes its uh, rooftops. The rooftops of the city are one of the best places to be in the city. So I did something on the rooftops of the city. I built a bar in a water tower on the rooftop. No one's paid any attention to the rooftops of New York City. That, you know, I'm I, so cool. Yeah, that's great. Maybe, imagine, many years from now, people are like, oh, maybe we should do things like roof buildings. No, no one's making that leap. I have no idea how to do that. I'm here to learn that right now. Well, I think actually, like, we maybe are something that strikes me as a similarity is that we, we really want to produce work that, for the little old lady in Japan, for that person. We want something with a shelf life. We want a story that is still interesting a year from now or two years from now, because the tornado isn't going to be interesting anymore. You want to create a story that has its own human, like drama, has its own art, is something that becomes a reference point. Um, and, and I think that we are increasingly challenged because we aren't creating, most journalists are not creating for the little old lady in Japan. They're creating for their, you know, like 1,200 Facebook friends, the, their followers on Twitter, there is only primary coverage, and, and, it, and it's uncontrolled and um, fragmented, and it very rarely coalesces into something beautiful and lasting. So I think that when, when we talk about documentation and legacy, we really are both talking about how do you defy that trend of just, you know, kind of tweets and create something that literally does reach people outside of our immediate sphere. 
So I think that's why you, you know you have to think about classic forms and making something that is sort of beautiful and people will want to share. And one thing about that is recreating. You know, if you if you went to the the night here and you went to that bar on the rooftop, try and as a documentarian recreate the experience of it. Not that you went up, you know, 421 stairs, but the excitement and the wonder and the unknowing, and then reveal and give your audience surprise, and then tell them more than what they would have known if they were there. That you know, a hundred years ago, someone was actually killed on the third floor that you just walked by. So you're always trying to create something that is has um, moments of um, unexpected revelation and has some payoff and that sort of thing. Because otherwise, it's just, I was there. I was there and it looked like this. So I think that's a valuable role. Just, um, just want to add one thing is that um, we often talk about legibility in the activist business, uh, creative activist business, which is how, it is essentially is the question, and now I finally understand what the hell we're talking about, <laughs> about how do we make what we are doing legible to the little old lady in Japan. But it's tricky, um, because at the very moment we, all, we want to be legible to the outside world, we also want to have an authentic experience for the inside world. And I think that Occupy Wall Street is a perfect case study of this, which is the very things that have had a lot of meaning for people inside the park, things like the General Assembly, things like having a million different signs for a million different issues, things like the People's Mic and so on and so forth, didn't make sense outside. It looked as confusion and chaos and so on and so forth. And it, again, the pro it is the problem of the avant-garde, which is the avant-garde is trying to imagine, bring into being, act as if there is a new world. At the same time, they have to communicate to the old world. If you're the avant-garde, it doesn't matter all that much. If you're a movement that's saying we are the 99%, it matters a lot. Um, and I'm not saying that as a critique, I'm saying that this is a tension about trying to bring into a new world while also speaking to the old one. Um, what I'm going to see up on the stage here uh, with this note of kind of transgressive place making underground spirit that uh, one of us is doing versus documentation and trying to uh, put on a public face and sort of like that. There's a, a note of uh, opacity versus kind of transparency. There is wanting to communicate with audience but sprinkling the right problems only then what you want to be known draw people into that versus what I see is sometimes the very happy side of a culture of public opinion, visibility, surveillance, and so regulation. Uh, and there can't be a place for radical place making, which is then new political ideas, new social realities, because um, visibility goes hand in hand with the ability to kind of neutralize and regulate that. And so often if we're trying to step forward and say, this needs to be seen, this needs to be talked about, um, on an activist front, it's saying we want to make history, but it's also saying we want to be documented done, found out, whereas I would say we don't want to be found out. We want there, we want there to be a that violent or miraculous or strange eruption of this new world that, that leaks and gets everyone into it. But as you said with the part with uh, sorry, with the civil rights movement, certain things were staged and there was an opacity that went on that we can't know until after the reporters didn't know anything about that. And so when that when that eruption of the new world comes out, it's not leaked, it's not exposed, it's intentional. And then it's story snowballs from there. Just to recap, opacity versus transparency. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and I think that's the tension. Is that is that um, and it's, it's increasingly hard to have opacity. Um, and I think that that's that's what you're getting at, is it's increasingly hard not only in sort of the transparency to a little old lady in Japan, but transparency to a greater larger security state. Um, we don't have that moment in which to sort of cultivate the cultures before we actually bring them out to the world. Civil rights movement, by the way, came out of black churches, which had years and years and years and years and years of opacity because no one gave a fuck outside the you know, African American community. And that developed the language, it developed dreams, it developed the cadence, it developed all the things that were absolutely necessary to then break through in the public place. What I do worry about, I, I agree, is that we don't have those moments um, to cultivate our own culture before we have to present them on the public stage. Yeah, and I totally agree that like the, 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 the sort of endangered opacity is why this many people are sitting here in this room or are drawn to the kind of work that they can find are doing is because there, there's at least the sense that there are fewer and fewer spaces that haven't been sort of co-opted or brought into um, sort of the mainstream or at least online. So, I think though that, that that's true and it's also an illusion because there's a whole lot of stuff in this country that no one gives a fuck about. And um, 
events and um, happenings and installations are amazing, but they're not stories. And it's a play between artist and activist and journalist, and there's a lot of interesting stuff happening there, but it's not stories. So, and then story is another problematic term, but I think if you go out there, you'll find that there are places that are extremely okay. And, um, you know, like, cartels run the, there are Mexican cartels that are in Native American reservations, and they're the de facto authority. No one knows about that. Why don't people know about that? So I think that, that we can easily fall into sort of like everything's been done in this country. Next question. So thanks to one of the presentations. I have a question about uh, images. We've been talking a lot about words But particularly the kind of issue of urban exploration, which is kind of what we did initially. Um, you know, images, as much as text and words, are just, we're so saturated. And particularly with the kind of urban exploration thing, there's this anecdote of, you know, you go to Detroit or you go wherever, you take a picture of what you think is this incredibly obscure, unknown, never discovered place. You check the hashtag of the people there already. And it's, you know, everything is discovered, everything is so shared. And I was really drawn to this idea about just showing that you were there, that there's no longer this kind of gap between your experiencing and broadcasting, that it almost becomes this instantaneous, like, I'm here now, the image is purely a token of my presence here, and it doesn't have that much longevity on that. Um, so how can images retain power and not just become, you know, a bit of Instagram so that, you know, that are just broadcasting kind of a short term. How do you make images that retain power? Is that the question? Yeah. And how do you stop images from just being I was there? How do you stop images from just being I was here? Look at me. Um, I think particularly in the case of urban exploration and the kind of images that come out of it, um, it is very problematic trying to make something um, living and lasting from those images because those images are not about things being alive or things being animated. Um, and so so by their nature, like it becomes very tight. It's not actually unique to the place. Um, so so um, you know I'm not I'm not trying to make like lasting mm -hmm. images of like decaying places. Um, I'm trying to like when I'm thinking about photographs of wanderlust events, I'm I'm more so interested in capturing still images of people doing unusual things and discovering things that they didn't expect through that and behaving in ways that they wouldn't otherwise because they had to cross over this boundary where however they behave in normal society doesn't doesn't work. And so there it becomes this issue of legibility again, right? If people are doing unusual things, by nature in a photograph, they're going to be unrecognizable. Um, so how then do you contextualize that photograph so that you can have something that's intriguing and different and on first blush unrecognizable but but then leads you deeper into something else. Um, I am I'm very much not interested in photographs that um, last outside of historical context um, and, and aren't worlds into into other worlds. Um, I feel like I didn't do a very good job answering your question but that was a start. I'll hand it over to the rest of the I think I actually think it's a great question because I'm not that interested in the image either. I'm interested in experience, um, and I think it's, it's lived experience which transforms people, not the presentation of an image or you know finding out about a fact. Um, I think there's a myth that you know somehow the truth sets us free. Uh, I always think of that uh, Hans Christian Andersen fairy tale that version of clothes, you know, where the kid sees the king parading in a buff and he whispers to the person next to him, you know, that he's wearing no clothes, and then they whisper not that he's wearing no clothes, and then the whole town says he's wearing no clothes, and everybody lives happily ever after. I don't think that's how things work. Um, I actually don't think people change their minds because they find out something new about the world, um, or that it's a revelation truth, and it gets an enlightenment fantasy. Um, I think people change because they have experiences. They have visceral moments. They have these, you know, someone tells them a story which transforms them. They hear it in 
embedded in an experience where the next day they look at the same space differently. Um, we used to organize these train parties uh, about 20 years ago, in which we take over trains. And, and the idea was, the subway trains, and the idea was is to have people go into the subway the next day and look at that space quite differently, which I think is similar to what you guys are doing as well. Um, now the question becomes is how do you communicate that experience in the little old way that you can? Um, and I'm not sure you can except by creating an experience for them. Yeah, that's, that, that's also my answer, which is I'm drawn to the images that take me on a journey somewhere. And the journey that's inside the image is not always the journey that the people who were captured in the image were taking. The image that journey that you take when you see that image. If there is a journey there, that's the journey. That's it. Well, on a much more practical note, like in my other life when I'm not recording, I'm, I run a storytelling platform which is image based. And um, it, you can have audio and text as well, but the image is sort of the first thing you see. And I get this question a lot, you know, how do you go beyond when I was there? And uh, I guess the simple answer after working with children and teenagers a lot with their stories, is I just tell them, tell me something you know about that image that I don't, by looking at it. And, and that's what the text is for. And so the first time you see the image, let's say a little girl holding her dog, you're like, I have seen this you know, a million times. If you hear that this was, you know, I'm thinking of a specific story, she says, sometimes I realize, you know, that don't have endless number of heartbeats, so I come back and hug you once more. And then you look at the, the photo in a different way, you see it with fresh eyes. And something has happened where you're, the way you see that image has been transformed. You've had an experience in that very short time of reading the text. So I think that that's a very simple way to use images that isn't simply sort of as a check-in. This uh, platform she's talking about is called Cowbird, and it's a really great place to go, uh, even if you aren't looking for a place to share your own images, although it's a great place to tell stories. It's a really good place to go and see how other people are creating something very moving and very, uh, very and hopefully lasting, but where people are telling stories that are, are uh, sometimes with very, very simple images and very simple words. Uh, and Calvert as an entire platform is built around doing that very powerfully and does a really great job. Just go and spend 10 minutes on Calvert and you'll see people doing exactly the thing that you're looking for. Next question. Sure, right here. Okay. I'm actually someone who's a bit of a Luddite. Um, I sort of have a lot of, um, maybe a bit of fear about technology and social media. Someone who's afraid to post things because I'm worried about consequences. Um, you know, or, or regrets, or maybe you post something and your opinion totally changes, um, or your perspective totally changes. So I'm just wondering if you guys have had any experience in that, you know, coming across, oh, I, I, my mind is totally changed, and then someone's going to go, oh, but you posted that, you know, last time. Or maybe you, see you um, published something that you yeah, regret later. How do you navigate dealing with the regret that comes after you? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's a stupid question. Yeah. <laughs> Andy, do you want to do regret? Oh, gosh. I take my mind so many times. Um, anytime I write a book, by the time it actually comes out, then you have to give a book talk, and people are like, you know, so you said such and such and such and such. I don't really agree with that. I'm so sorry. Uh, uh, that doesn't go over very well. Uh, I'll, I'll leave you with a, a, a story. Um, John Maynard Keynes, the economist, um, was once accused of changing his mind. Um, and his, his, uh, his response was, you know, I, I, I change my opinions, but the facts change. What do you do? Uh, and, I, and I think that that's kind of a nice way of looking at it. Is life is a stream, things change, um, and one would hope that your ideas and opinions change on the life's course. Okay, one more question. Right here. I think that was a great transition. I'm going to ask the question. 
Alice Obscuro for hosting this series, and uh, to Derby for building this awesome set. Um, uh, yeah, I think that's it. Thank you to everyone who's helped us uh, put on this series. This has been a really fun month. Um, and uh, we'll have a recap of this uh, posted online here sometime next week. And we'll, we'll send that and we'll email that out to everybody. Um, yeah, thank you guys all for coming. Thank you so much for being here.